Northway family, good to see you here this week. Y'all doing all right? Oh, come on now. I just sat in worship with y'all a second ago and something was happening in this room and then it just left right then. So let's get it back in here. Let's go caffeinated service. Let's get after this. Good to see y'all this week. If I haven't met you, my name is Shay Sumlin, one of the pastors here and grateful you're with us here on this Palm Sunday. We're heading into Holy Week and uh, man, so excited as we kind of set our heart's attention, our focus, our, um, our affections upon what's coming to the end of this week with Good Friday and Easter as we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna sneak one more Genesis message in here before we fully dive in. So if you have a Bible with you, I'd love for you to turn with me to Genesis chapter two. We are uh, continuing our study here in Genesis. What is for us the book of origins, looking at the creation of all things that God has made for his glory and for our good. And what we've seen so far in this uh, study through the first couple of chapters here is chapter one is really a kind of a panoramic view, a wide angle lens of creation, of God creating everything visible and invisible in six days. And when you get to chapter two, chapter two is not a rival account to chapter one. Chapter two is actually a tighter focus. The camera squeezes in a little bit and actually drills down on one of those specific days in chapter one. We're gonna look, we looked at day six, the the creation of the crown jewel of creation, humanity, man and woman made in the image of God. And as the camera zooms in, we get a little bit of commentary on how the first man and the first woman were made. And, uh, and so last week we looked at the creation of man, of Adam, the first male, and we saw God take, first of all, do something different than he's done in all of creation. All of creation, he has the Hebrew word we talked about as barad. He created something out of nothing. But then with Adam, all of a sudden we see him shift to asaing, which is the idea of making something out of something. He takes dirt of the earth and he forms the man out of it. And then he breathes life into that man. And then he takes that man, this new living creature that he has created, and he places that man in a garden and he gives him a work to do and a will to obey. And that's what we looked at last week. And all is in keeping with God's design that should bring about the glory of God and the ultimate flourishing of his creation. But what we're gonna see this week is that in that account, there's one thing that was missing so far. And we're gonna see the creation of the first woman. And we're gonna see the establishment of the very first marriage here in Genesis chapter two. And I'm gonna read this text that we're gonna be in and then we'll take a look at it here. Starting in verse 18 of chapter two, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And, what, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heaven and the, birds and the beasts of the field. And, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. It's the word of God. The question I wanna ask, and I think it's the question in many ways this text, this text is asking us, is why did God to go through so much trouble in the creation of the first man and the first woman? When everything thus far, as God just said it, and it was, 
Why wouldn't God just say it and Adam and Eve appear at the same time? Why go through all the trouble of first forming the man out of dust, breathing life into him, placing him in a garden, parading animals in front of him to name those animals, and then, and then out of him, calls him to go to sleep, pull out a rib from his side, fashion a woman, and then present that woman to him and give her to him in marriage. Like why all these steps when everything that we've seen thus far was just God said it and it was. And what I wanna show you is that there is an actual design that is at play that God wants us to see. There are postures and there are patterns contained here in Genesis chapter two that are intended to carry all the way throughout the rest of scripture and all the way into humanity as we know it today. And there is an intentional design that is at play here that we're intended to see. And here's kind of the, the movements that I want you to see where we're gonna head through this text. We're gonna look at five things, five movements in this passage. First, we're gonna see that the need for companionship was anticipated by God in verse 18. Then we're gonna see in verse 19 and 20 that the need for companionship was then created for the man. And then we're gonna see in verses 21 to 23 that the need for companionship was thus provided for that man. And then we'll see in verses 24 and 25, the union of marriage established. And by God's grace, what I wanna show you fifthly is the union of marriage that is ultimately fulfilled, not in this text, but this text serves as a shadow to point us to a greater substance of what marriage is all about. And so let's dive in here. Let's start with verse 18. Let's look at the need for companionship that is anticipated by God. Verse 18, the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. You need to know 11 times so far in Genesis one and two, we have seen the word good. God creates and he says it's good. He creates again, he says it's good. It is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. And now all of a sudden, for the first time in all of creation and in all of human history, for the very first time, we see that something is not good. It is not good that man should be alone. Human aloneness is not good as God decrees right here. Now. Right up front, it's important to note, and I think we need to recognize here because this is important, what this does not mean. What this does not mean is that somehow life is incomplete if you're not married. That somehow singleness is a curse for you to endure because God is holding out on you. That somehow a breakup or a divorce or even God forbid the death of a spouse has left you existentially lacking meaning and value in your life that is somehow incomplete for you. I do not think that this is what is in mind here in this text because if that is true, if singleness is a curse, if you're just waiting out on a better life until you can get married, then somebody forgot to tell Jesus and somebody forgot to tell the apostle Paul who penned the majority of your New Testament. Now, I don't, I don't think that's what's going on right here. So the question that begs is, so what is it that is not good then about Adam being alone? Well, I think there's three things in mind here that I think are found in this text. For, for one, everything that God has created thus far has a counterpart to it. The day has night, the sun has the moon, the waters have fish, the birds uh, have the sky, the, the land has the animals. Even within the animal realm, there is a male and there is a female. Everything that God's created thus far has a counterpart to it except for the man. And I think with that, until there is a, a female counterpart, it will be impossible for Adam to be able to fulfill the creation mandate, the kingdom mandate uh, that we saw back in chapter one 
to multiply, to be fruitful and multiply and go fill the earth. Because last I checked, it's pretty much impossible to do that as an alone man by himself. But I think most importantly and thirdly, I think theologically, what is primary in this text about why it's not good to be alone is the main reason is that mankind, both male and female, was created to be in the image of God. So let me ask this question, has God ever been alone? No, God has never been alone. God exists in triunity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit from eternity past through eternity future, he is communally sufficient within himself. He has never been in need of anything. And we've said it before, God did not create man and woman because he was lonely and needed to fill a void. He exists perfectly in triunity together as three persons, one God. And so until God creates a 100% equal and yet completely distinct corresponding counterpart to Adam, then humanity's image of God that is stamped on this earth won't be complete as God has designed it of both male and female. And this is such a beautiful thing. Yes, it's gonna speak to marriage here in just a moment, but this is a universal truth. What's true of marriage in this context is really true of every one of us. Even if you fast forward into the New Testament, when we understand the workings of the church, what brings the image of God to bear is male and female side by side brothers and sisters together displaying the image of God as we together go and fulfill our kingdom mandates that he has given us that brings glory to him and good for the human flourishing of the creation. And so there is an image that is lacking if it's just male or if it's just female. Together we bear that image. It's beautiful. Now, what I want you to notice here though is that Adam doesn't seem to be aware of his need yet. God is the one who says it's not good for Adam to be alone. As far as we know, there's no indication here that Adam was lonely or was even aware of something was missing. He appears to be perfectly content in the work that he is doing that God gave him to do. Again, it is God who anticipates this need for companionship for Adam. God declares this. And so what is God going to do about it? Well, it says he's going to create a helper who is fit for him, literally who is corresponding to him. He's going to create a helper and that helper, we need to deal with this word right up front as it pertains to the woman, as it pertains to the wife, that term helper is not a derogatory term for a woman. It carries no connotations of any diminished worth or status or value. It's not describing a servant or a slave for Adam. No, in fact, the only other time that that word is used throughout scripture, it is God the Father is a strong help for us and God the Spirit who comes alongside his church and strengthens her. And so that term's in good company. One who is fit, the one who will correspond to Adam was given to help him image God and fulfill the creation mandate that he by himself could not do alone. Now, here's what's interesting. You would expect that what comes right after verse 18 is verse 21, that God would then provide the woman as that image bearing counterpart, but it doesn't. We get this weird interlude here in verse 19 and 20 of Adam having a parade of animals in front of him, getting to name them all of a sudden. You're like, well, what the, why is the delay here? What's this about? And I think what we're gonna see here is that God has to get Adam to see his need so that Adam can learn to depend on God to provide for it. So how should God get Adam to perceive his need the way that God perceives it? Should he put him in a marriage seminar? 
get him in a marriage class real quick, put him in a singles ministry. Let's go ahead and install Hinge on his iPhone right now so we can get that going. Like how does he get Adam to be aware of his need? It's interesting. In the garden, he brings before him a handful of species. Now I don't believe that every single animal species that's ever lived on earth is in mind right here, but I think it's what's in the garden And as they come by, Adam gets to exercise his dominion mandate to name those animals. Which, by the way, naming throughout the Bible is an exercise of dominion. You see God naming, you see humans get the privilege to name other humans. And Adam here gets the privilege of naming the animals. He'll get the privilege of naming his wife, not once, but twice here in just a moment. He's exercising this dominion, but there's a purpose in it. Because for every species that comes by in names, he is observing there's something different about them from him. Every one of them is going, man, none of these, none of these animals look like me. None of these animals correspond to me. They are of their kind and I have of my kind and these two aren't alike. And in addition, every animal species has a male and female counterpart and I don't seem to have one of those. And so God, I believe, is bringing this situation to bear so that Adam might recognize his need for companionship. God is creating that need in Adam so that Adam would learn to depend upon God. Because what's Adam gonna do about it once he discovers his need? You know what the answer is? Nothing. Because Adam doesn't have the ability to create a woman. Uh, He doesn't have that. He's gonna have to go to God to provide for him in a way that he cannot provide for himself. And by the way, that idea is gonna carry all the way through scripture, even into this room today. God has a beautiful way of showing us our inadequacies so that we can depend upon him for his sufficiency and his provision and trust him in it. And so you'll see now, God then brings about the need for companionship. He now provides it starting in verses 21 through 23. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last. You can see that Adam now recognizes his need. At last, finally, there she is. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called, she shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of Ish, man. Now, incidentally, for the singles in the room, I gotta just tell you, those who are interested in a mate, this is not a bad way to get one right here. For you to understand the garden first that God has put you in to tend to. To understand the garden that God has prepared for you. For you to go be faithful in the work that God has given you in your singleness. To go cultivate, to go image bear, to go tend to the work that he's provided for you. To be the kind of man or woman that God has created and designed you to be for his glory. And that when you recognize your insufficiencies, when you recognize your inadequacies, that you would cry out to God for his provision. And then you would sleep at night, resting in the will of God to provide and trusting him with it. And so right here, this moment is incredibly significant. And I think it's significant for two primary reasons. What we highlight here, what we're gonna see, and I wanna spend a little time on this text we just read, is we see both the equality and the unique distinctions between male and female that God has designed. And in our cultural moment today, I think it's absolutely imperative we understand this, the good of what God has designed. And first of all, we see the equality. We already saw this in Genesis chapter one, verse 26. Both male and female are made in the image of God. Equal worth, equal dignity, equal value. And what you need to know is this account of God creating Eve, this would have been absolutely radical in Moses' day. In a day 3,500 years ago where Moses is coming off Sinai, 
He's giving the whole law of God to his people, Genesis to Deuteronomy. They're coming out of Egypt. They're heading towards Canaan. And all of a sudden, Moses comes down here and this story that God has provided of how Eve was created, I don't know if you know this, but every origin story that existed in Moses' day, not one of them had a creation of woman account. Genesis is elevating the status of a woman like no other account has ever done before, of equal dignity and value to the man. Both of them on the same playing field, both of them in the same image of God. According to God, she is 100% equal and worth dignity and value. So much so that even Peter would say in 1 Peter 3 that both men and women are co-heirs in the grace of life together. Both are seen in Genesis as co-equal, co-vice regents, who have been called to steward and exercise dominion over the earth, to subdue it, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There is no such thing in this text as one who is superior while the other is inferior. Any worldview that holds to that has been produced by sin, not by God. They are equal. And so we see here that the woman is fashioned by God and it was fascinating, you get this picture that God is playing the role of the father of the bride in this moment. That he has created her and he's now walking her down the aisle to present her to her bridegroom. It's this beautiful imagery that's being used here. And I want you to note the very first recorded words ever in human history are right here. And it's the words of a groom singing a sonnet over his bride-to-be. It is an expression of absolute delight in her as God's perfect compliment to him. So beautiful. And she is taken from a bone, a rib in the side of Adam. Now, a lot of deep studies have gone into why there and not any other place and some Cute, fanciful stories have emerged from that, even in the Talmud, which is the rabbinic interpretations of these accounts of scripture. There is a famous story about why they supposed she was taken from the rib. And Matthew Henry uh, uh, eventually took this and ran with it and said this, the woman is not made out of his head to top him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him under his arm to be protected and near his heart. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I think that's a lot more poetic than it is theological. Um, but nonetheless, I think he's getting at something here. And what's even more profound is that when God presents her to Adam as his wife-to-be, he is presenting her not as a union, but as a reunion. That's the imagery that we're given right here. She's being given back to him as a reunion. In fact, John Calvin put it this way. Something was taken from Adam in order that he might embrace with greater benevolence part of himself. Adam may have lost a rib, but he gained back a far richer reward since he obtained a faithful associate of life since he now saw himself in her. Paul is gonna play off this, by the way. In the book of Ephesians, when he writes to the church at Ephesus and he's describing in Ephesians chapter five, the dynamics of marriage between a husband and a wife, he drops this statement. In the same way, you husbands are to love your wives as your own bodies. Now we read that and we've heard this preached before and very practical outwork. Yeah, because we wash ourselves, we feed ourselves, we nourish ourselves. So why, why wouldn't we care for the same for our mate? And that's true and that's godly and that's good. But Paul's not speaking of just pragmatics here. He's dropping Genesis 2. You're to love your wife, husbands, because she's part of you. That's where she came from. It's her origin. You are not independent of one another. You are interdependent upon one another. You are of equal dignity and value. This, by the way, I believe is why marriage must be between one man and one woman. 
not just for the biological complementing, which we'll see in a moment, but also for the spiritual design of oneness in how our male-female complementarity is reflecting itself in the image of God's design in creation as male and female. Adam is saying, the reason you are fit for me is because you were taken from me. It's a beautiful picture of equality. But there's also a picture in here of God-designed distinctions. There's a lot in which we are the same, but there is a lot in which we are purposefully distinct from one another. I think uh, three key reasons, one, or three key distinctions. One of them, certainly the obvious, would be in our, well, I hope it's obvious, in our biology, in our gender and our sexuality. Right up front, I think it's important to note, there are God-designed binary differences between a man, a male, and a female. And in fact, even in Hebrew language, Hebrew language is very pictorial. It's describing what is seen. And the word for male in Genesis 1 is the Hebrew word zakar, which in Hebrew means the piercing one. And the word for female is the word nekaba, which is the word in Hebrew that means the pierced one. Now, I'm just gonna stop short right there of our anatomy class, but there is a very visual image in the Hebrew language of our identity. God given distinct identity as male and female that are complementary to one another by design. And this is important because of the ability to fulfill the creation mandate to be fruitful and multiply. A male can't do that on his own and a female can't do that on her own. This is the complementarity that we are to see in our distinction that is for our good and for the kingdom and creation mandate. In addition to that, there's distinction not only in our biology, but also in our ontology. Ontology is the idea of essence or being. As human beings, our essence as, as man and woman is inherently reflected, our distinctions is inherently reflected in our ontology. Think about the terms man and woman. Um, Adam says, I'm gonna call her woman. It's the Hebrew word isha, because she is taken out of man, the Hebrew word ish. It's just one article, a feminine article that's added to the end and changes from man to woman. Just as in English language, two syllables is the difference between man and woman that are there. But what's interesting is when you get into the etymology of the Hebrew words ish and isha, the root words that were used in Jewish nomenclature to, to speak to male, man and woman, ish meant to be strong, isha means to be soft and delicate. These are observations of God's design woven into the fabric of our identity as man and woman. And this is important because of how our physical bodies will correspond to the unique work that God gave the man and the woman. The man intending to the ground given a strong body for that, the woman tending to the nurture of the next generation, giving a soft and delicate body towards that, there is a uniqueness that's woven in there. Now, at the same time, please understand what this is not saying here is that this is some prescription to say that a woman can never be strong and can never take on hard labor. Good Lord, I know too many women that could just trump that thing right now. Yeah, and if you, have, you believe that, you haven't read Ruth, you haven't read Song of Solomon, you haven't read Proverbs about the woman who's dignified in her labor and hard work and industrious that's out there. It's not what this is saying, nor is this saying that a man can't be soft and tender, that a true man is one who hunts elk and drives a, a Ford F-350 and has a gun rack in the back. And that's more Texan than it is theological. And again, if you don't think that, then you've never spent time with Jesus, never spent time with David. You've never seen somebody be both strong and tender at the same time. No, certainly there are many parts of how one particular culture might describe masculinity or femininity 
that are in ways indeed socially constructed that are completely stereotyped and totally not helpful. That's not what's going on here. But at the same time, to not honor the obvious distinctions in our physical biology and ontology is to miss the inherent design of God's purpose in making us unique counterparts that perfectly complement one another for God's purposes. The truth is, is our world is incredibly confused right now in this area. The focus right now, the mantra of our day is sameness. Sameness, massive efforts underway, both in the culture around us and sadly, even in the churches amongst us to try and eradicate all distinctions between men and women, all roles, all abilities, all gender. And they'll say that all of it's just simply social constructs to the point now that even the science of our sexual biology is now debated as not being distinct. And to miss or deny the uniqueness of our design as male and female, as man and woman is to rob the image of God that he put in us. And it is to rob the unique calling and contributions that each of us will bring to the table for the good of the other. Now, that being said, I think there's a third distinction that we need to pay attention to here. And and that is the distinction in roles that God seems to provide in the context of this first man and woman and in the context of marriage. And roles that are not meant to be prescriptions here, follow these 10 things and this is what you gotta do, but more of postures and patterns in the design that we'll see carried throughout the rest of scripture and into humanity. And I want you to notice the fact that Adam was indeed the one who was created first. Again, why is that? Why didn't God, he could have done anything. Why did he make Adam first and then choose to make Eve out of Adam? But I want you to understand the idea of first is never an insignificant deal in scripture. Think about all the firsts that we see in scripture, the first and great commandment, the firstborn of families. Honor the Lord with your first fruits. Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. Jesus, through his resurrection, is the first fruits of our salvation. Seek first the kingdom of God. First is always significant. And here, when God could have easily made them both at the same time, he chose to make Adam first. Now, it is not saying, again, please don't read into this, that that means that Oh, it's because man is superior or smarter or more intelligent than the woman or more deserving or more entitled. It's nowhere in here. We've already seen that in their equality. But what it is indicating, I believe, is it's speaking to the type of role that Adam is going to play in his marriage as both a priest and protector within that union. And it's interesting to me that many millennia later, In the first century in Ephesus, the apostle Paul was being asked why it was a woman was not to serve as the elder and overseer in the local assembly of the church, which is the bride of Christ. And Paul says these words in 1 Timothy 2. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Context of that being in the role of an elder who is teaching and governing in the local assembly of the church. That's the context of that statement. She is to remain quiet in that regard. And the reason is, notice what he says, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. That's interesting. You know what he didn't say? that the reason a woman was not to serve as an elder is because she's just inferior to the man. The man is more intelligent. He's gonna be better theologically sound. It's none of that. Nor does it say that the reason she can't be is because they were living in a patriarchal first century society that was marred by the effects of sin and male dominance. It's not what he says. The reason is, is he goes back to Genesis two. It's rooted in a design that God has both in the context of marriage as well as in the context of an elder within the local church. 
And when you think about this mantle of leadership, we gotta get rid of like weird baggage stereotypes. When I first got married, I heard teaching on spiritual leadership. I didn't know what that meant. Does that mean that I need to make every decision like where we go to eat fast food and that's leadership? Do I need to... Do I need to set up a podium in my living room and go, everybody gather around, let me exposit the word for you so you're incapable of doing it on your own. Let me do it for you. Is it, I didn't know, what the heck does spiritual leadership mean? What is this idea here? And as you really dive into, you find those are all weird interpretations that are not present here in the text. It's also used of the term of headship. It's the idea of being a representative for that union. Doesn't mean that there's not equality there. You're both leading the charge together. We're doing this thing in unity and in plurality and we're running together. But at the end of the day, there is a representative head who is held accountable for the spiritual health of that union. My job is to not to try to dominate and do all the teaching. My job is to initiate in my home in cultivating the type of soil in my marriage and in my home where godly fruit can grow, where my wife and my children and myself can all flourish to the glory of God and set them free to do what God has created them to do. Like that's a a picture that's here. Adam, it's interesting, is given the initial command regarding the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. And implicitly we might observe that he is the one that is now responsible or accountable for both he and his wife and guarding that command because that command was given pre-Eve. Now, one might argue today, well, that's an argument from silence, isn't it? Well, yeah, maybe in this chapter until we get to the next one. Because when you get to chapter three and the wheels fall off this whole bus, when sin enters the picture, it is the woman who is the first to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Technically the first in this context to sin, and yet, who is the one that is held accountable when God comes along? It is Adam. He's the one that is held accountable. It doesn't mean that she's not responsible for her own conduct, her own sin, and the implications thereof. No, they will both equally uh, be under the curses when we see in chapter three. But Adam is the one that God goes to. Adam is the one that is held accountable in this situation for that union. Now, please note a couple more things here quickly. This kind of godly leadership is only designated by God for husbands in marriage and for elders in the church. This is not binding on all men over all women at all times in all places. It's not what that command means here. And the truth is in both the home and in the church, Adam here, when given this position of leadership in the garden, when it is done well, it always leads to the flourishing of the creation around him. This is a godly authority that was designed to be exercised rightly rather than be twisted as sin has done so. It is a sacrificial leadership that is given for the benefit of others, not their harm. When you see a marriage where a woman is harmed by a male trying to use scripture to defend his right to dominate her, that is the product of sin, not his savior. That is the product of his own errant flesh, not God's decree. This is a beautiful design meant for flourishing. It's why Jesus, or why Paul will say, husbands, you are to love your wives like Christ loved the church. It is a sacrificial leadership. One that's not passive or deferring and one that's not dominant and authoritative and abusive, but one that sacrificially lays down one's life so the other can flourish as God has designed them in the same way that the woman is gonna serve the husband to flourish in the way that God has designed him. It's a mutual interdependence that's here. We're meant to see these distinctions and this equality. And what then happens after that? In verse 24, fourthly, we then see now the union of marriage that is established. Verse 24, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. I want you to note right here, verse 24, this is the first 
interpretive statement in the entire Bible in verse 24. It breaks. We've been in narrative this entire time describing the creation account. And now we break in verse 24 right here because after writing all of these accounts of creation that God gave Moses down, Moses is gonna stop here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and say, pay attention, Israel. Don't miss what was just said and interprets now the meaning of marriage for all of Israel. And you gotta remember, Moses is writing to these Hebrew slaves in the wilderness And he's saying, before we go a step further and giving you the rest of the law, all the way to Deuteronomy here, the first five books of the Bible, we have got to stop right here and lay down the most primal thing that will hold a people, a nation together. And it's the family submitted under God to his design. Long before civil government ever gets created, which we'll see in the coming chapters, It is marriage that is designed by God to be the design for human flourishing for the generations to come, a healthy marriage. And so Moses turns to the people and says, let's get our theology straight concerning marriage. Three things that you see in uh, in this verse, in verse 24, that help us define a biblical marriage. Three things that are requisite to form a biblical marriage. Dependence on God, independence from parents and interdependence between spouses. All three things must exist. Dependence on God, understand the covenantal union of a marriage between one man and one woman is not a social construct. This is not herd behavior. It's not open for interpretation or adaptation. Why? Because man didn't invent marriage, God did. And we are utterly dependent upon his design if a marriage is to go the way that God intended it to be. And what the creator has joined together in the creation of these two becoming one flesh, no creature has the authority to intercede on that and change it. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 19, he quotes this verse, Genesis 2, 24. And then after it says, what God has brought together, let no man separate. Why? Because that's how this thing started, by God making the two become one. And it's for this reason, therefore, our oneness is totally dependent upon God's design. Marriage must start with two people humbling the knee before God and saying, not my will be done in this thing, but your will. We're here to follow your playbook, not ours if we're ever gonna experience human flourishing. But secondly, it also involves independence from parents. Not just dependence upon God, but independence from parents. The reason the husband is to leave his father and mother is because it's the primary the idea that the priority has now shifted from him being the one who receives provision from his parents to now him going to be the one who now makes provision for this new family that's being forged. And there must be a separation there. And I have no time at all to talk about what kind of issue this is in our culture right now. But the truth is there's gotta be a healthy break, a leaving in order to cleave. A man who must leave the dependence of his parents to the nurture of his parents so that he can go with his wife together and forge a new family unit to image God together. And that's a God designed thing. And the point is thirdly, that that would create interdependence, oneness between spouses. Meaning there is a bonding together that is never to separate. This is certainly signified in the sexual union of consummation that takes place in a marriage where literally two bodies are physically becoming one, But this goes even beyond that, showing that in this covenantal union, a new family identity is being forged. They are no longer two, they are one. Paul plays off this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 11 and 12, when he says, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. Did you catch that? 
The woman can never be independent from man because her origin came from man's rib. But man can never be independent from the woman because every man from this point forward is gonna be brought into the world through a woman. We are interdependent upon one another. Like it, for better, for worse. We're together in this thing, y'all. And so in the context of marriage, there is, there is this interdependence that is playing. We are totally interdependent. But I love how this passage is capstone here by telling us the result of this design is that this man and this woman in the holy union of marriage, they were naked and they were not ashamed. Because on this side of the fall, this side of sin, you and I both know that one of the most vulnerable places you can ever be is totally exposed in front of another. And I'm not just talking physically with your clothes off, but I'm talking no secrets, no hidden agendas, all motives of the heart, fully exposed. That could be one of the most vulnerable places in the world. And it can incite on this side of sin, it can incite shame in all of us. Shame is induced really of one of three biblical reasons. Either it's our own sin that has been committed that brought collateral damage upon ourselves and shame from our own mistakes, or it's the sin of others who have committed against us, victimized us, and there's a shame that goes with that. Or sometimes, quite honestly, it's just the effects of sin, of living in a broken and fallen world where bodies don't work like they should, that can also carry a shame. And yet here, in this first marriage, there is nothing to hide before God or one another a perfect worship, there is a perfect creation, a perfect work, perfect bodies, perfect relationship, perfect love. It's what we all long for and what we're all trying to get back to. The only thing that could possibly ruin what was given at the end of Genesis chapter two is if the creation itself is going to decide to rebel against God's design which is exactly what's gonna happen in the very next chapter that we'll look at when we get to chapter three. But I don't wanna leave tonight without showing you one last thing, a fifth thing that speaks about the meaning of marriage. And that is the union of marriage that will one day be fulfilled in its perfect substance. Do you know that the apostle Paul, again in Ephesians chapter five, in talking about the dynamics of marriage between a husband and a wife, quotes Genesis 2, 24. But what he says after it would absolutely floor the mind of a Hebrew Jew that was reading this text. He says this in Ephesians 5, verse 31 and 32. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And every Jew would know what that meant. Genesis 2, 24, God's design for marriage, yes and amen. But then Paul says this, but oh, marriage is not at all necessarily what you think the end of it is. He says this mystery of marriage is profound. And I am referring to Christ and the church. Now, again, any Jew that would be reading this or hearing this at the time, would have went, what did you just say? All these years we've understood Genesis 2, 24 to be about one man and one woman and the beauty of marriage and God's design for human flourishing and glory and the image of God, yes and amen. But now you just told me all along it was actually about something else. And here's the idea. It's as if God in eternity past, knowing knowing that his creation, which he made in his own image, by which he loved to have relationship with him, unbroken, undefiled, would rebel against him. That sin would enter into the world and would fracture everything and alienate those men and those women from him. And God knowing that, now knowing he would send his son, Jesus Christ, to come and to live the perfect righteous life that you and I failed to live, to go and culminate the ministry that he was brought here for, to hang on a cross 
so that he might absorb the just wrath that was due us and the penalty of our sin, which was death, take it off us and put it on him and shed his blood so that our sins could be atoned for, to be covered and forgiven, that by faith in him through his grace and mercy, we would receive not only salvation, but adoption as sons and daughters brought back into the family of God, clothed in his righteousness and secured forevermore. God knowing that wonderful news, it's as if an eternity past went, what is a good metaphor that I can use that I can show the rest of the world that even if they don't believe in me, when they see this picture, they'll get an idea of how much I love them. I got it. I'm gonna make marriage. And in this institution, the husband will play the role of Christ who will willingly and lovingly and sacrificially lay down his life for the good of his bride. And that wife clothed in that righteousness will then serve that union for the good and the glory of that husband that will lead into an ultimate glory to God. And in doing so, when any human being looks upon a marriage like that with a husband who sacrificially leads and a wife who respectfully follows and they do this in tandem together, whether they believe in me or not, they'll have a picture of how much I love them and how much I have longed and how much I went through to send my son to them to die for your sins and bring them into relationship with me. Oh, how I love you. And that's what God gave. And that's the image. That's what Paul is saying. This is what marriage is ultimately about. So much so that do you understand the beauty of understanding how Genesis begins and how Revelation ends? Do you realize the Bible begins with a garden and ends with a garden? The first garden we just saw had beautiful gemstones in it, had trees, that had the tree of life in it. There was rivers running through it. Perfect humanity and communion with God. The last image you have in the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, there is another garden in the new heavens, the new earth. And that garden too has beautiful gemstones in it, has a river of life running through it, has a tree of life whose leaves are gonna be for the healing of all that has been broken. Perfect, perfect unity with God, unbroken fellowship, no longer stained by sin. And at the same time, the Bible also begins with a wedding and ends with a wedding. This first marriage we saw in Genesis 2, there's another one coming at the end. Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the land. And that is the moment when you and I who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ are ushered in to the presence of our bridegroom. And there we will be with him forevermore. It is for that reason that we understand. We understand this first marriage began with a couple that was naked and unashamed before God. That last wedding, y'all, that last wedding in our marriage to Christ, we're going to be given white linen robes. It is speaking to the same reality. We will be unashamed. We will be unafraid. We will be redeemed and washed by the blood of Christ. Christ's work on the cross is what brings us back to that innocence. And I love how Kevin DeYoung said it, all of us in some way or somehow are ashamed. Some fear of being found out, disrobed, discovered. None of us have yet to enjoy what Adam and Eve felt like at that first wedding, but all of us who are in Christ will know what it's like at that final wedding. In that moment, the union of the husband and wife will give away. It's a reason why Jesus said in Matthew 22, there will be no more marriages in heaven. Some of you are like, what? I'm sorry, if I just broke your heart. There are no marriages in heaven. You know why? Because this union was always meant to be a shadow that will give way to a greater union when we enter into paradise. And in that moment, that union is not dependent upon your marital status in this life, whether you're single or ever find a spouse. That union is dependent upon faith in God who has richly loved you and gave his son for you. This is the beauty, this is the picture of marriage. May we have the courage in our day to fight and contend for this kind of design against a world that is hostile towards it, to understand that in this design, we will find God's glory and our flourishing, amen?
Let's pray. Father, thank you for the picture you gave us here. Not only the picture of what marriage is intended to be, what human companionship was intended to be reflecting the triunity of the image of you, O oh God. The beauty of your design that is meant to lead towards human flourishing and the future of the next generations and the image of yourself stamped throughout this earth. But God, thank you that more than anything, this image points us to the greater substance. That by faith in Jesus Christ, we who are single or married, divorced, lost a spouse, gone through a breakup, but we have the promise there is a better union waiting for us that has already been purchased by Jesus. Oh God, would you hold us fast, persevere to the end until that day when we will be yours and you will be ours forevermore. In Jesus' name.